Okay, at this time, we're going to have our first message for today, brought to us by Mr. Reg Noland. It is entitled, The Divine Sense of Humor. Okay. Because of everything that has been very dark and heavy of late, I decided to do something lighter today to try to show you that God has a sense of humor. God has a sense of humor. Once I heard a two-line joke that goes like this. Question, you want to know how to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Tell him your plans. Okay? Believe it or not, our Lord does have a rather sophisticated but subtle sense of humor. For example, back in 1984, he sent me rather unexpectedly here to Lawrence, who hasn't been able to get rid of me ever since. Now, if that doesn't show God's sense of humor, I don't know what else does. Okay, throughout the cosmos, many of his creations uh, illustrate the divine sense of humor. So today, I'd like to highlight several of the uh, uh, oddities in the cosmos uh, and on our earth as well. Uh, to go through several Bible studies and scriptural passages that demonstrate that our uh, Lord's strong sense of humor from the very subtle to the wry grin to the belly-shaking, roll-on-the-floor laugh fest that we have. Okay, so... Here's my first question. Do you know how to make God laugh? And the answer is, tell him your plan. Okay. Now, uh, most of these are going to be pictures. That I'm going to make some comments on as well. And it's not doing it. Come on. No. Hey, it's not advancing it, Brian. Do what? <laughs> oh, am I do the point up here? Where? It's not advancing it. See? Okay. Okay, meanwhile, uh, the um, ushers are passing out to you a sheet. Here and this on one side of it, I have several of the biblical stories that I found very, very amusing, and I'm going to go through some of those with you. On the back side of this, uh, I have listed for you the ten plagues of uh, of uh, the Exodus here against Egypt, and how basically uh, God played rope a dope with the uh, gods of Egypt. So if you want to, this or here, if you want further consultation on the gods of Egypt, you need to see Professor Joseph. Okay, there we go. What was wrong? Have no idea. All right. Okay. Oddities of creation. I want to start off with these as well. And uh, throughout our universe, God has created a lot of physical laws that everything obeys. Okay. One of those is the law of thermal contraction and expansion. When you heat something up, it expands and gets bigger, longer. If you cool it down, it gets smaller and shorter. Now that works for everything except water. Hmm. Why? Isn't that something just to make you say, huh, why did that happen? All right, here's what, what actually goes on. Water condenses, contracts, uh, goes smaller until 4 degrees uh, Celsius or about 39 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which it reaches its densest part. If you cool water beyond 4 degrees uh, Celsius or um, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, then it begins to become less dense. It begins to expand a bit. So then, as you see here, uh, the warmest water is at the bottom of the pond and the ice formed up here is at the top. That sounds strange. Why would you do something like that? Well, actually, this is a wonderful, wonderful idea because it preserves life. The warmest water is down in the bottom now so that all the sea critters or the uh, 
aquatic critters in the, in the ponds and the lake can go down to the bottom and survive these harsh winters. Huh, who would have thought something like that? And water is the only substance that behaves that way. So, interesting. Okay, that's uh, good. Here's our solar system. Uh, the planets and things. Now, this is the one that we learn way... Oops, wrong one. Back up. Come on, back up. There we go. This is the one that we learned. The traditional solar system with uh, Mercury and Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Okay, that's the one we learned. All in a nice um, elliptical plane here, and they orbit around the sun. Today, that has been revised a bit. For example, uh, Merc uh, Pluto is no longer considered a full-fledged planet, but that's now a dwarf planet. Out beyond the Kyber Belt, we have other dwarf planets and such objects as well. So it's been slightly revised. Our planetary system also has some oddities about it. You would think that since they're all in a nice e elliptical plane that way, that they have similar properties and things. But it turns out that they don't. There's some oddities about it. For example, the tilt of the planet uh, 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 along the way. Uh, Mercury is so overpowered by the sun that it's almost perpendicular to the elliptical plane. It's only 0.1 uh, degrees off. Venus is an oddball because it is 177 degrees off, effectively turning it upside down so that when it's spinning upside down, it appears to be spinning backwards uh, from our normal perspective. Earth, of course, is about 23 degrees, 23 and a half degrees off. Mars, pretty close. Mars is our sister planet. It's about 25 degrees. Jupiter is so large that it can uh, stand up and be perpendicular to the plane as well. Saturn's about the same as Earth, but Mars just a little bit bigger. And then we've got Uranus. Now, Uranus is an oddball. Because instead of spinning around like this, it spins this way. Because its axis is at a 98 degree uh, tilt. It turns it upside down. Why'd God do that? Again, this illustrates what I would think of as a sense of humor. Just as we're getting used to people, uh, the planet spinning this way, he suddenly turns over and makes one spin this way. Okay? Uh, how about Neptune? Neptune is about 30 degrees off of the uh, vertical, and Pluto is 120 degrees off the vertical. They also say that there's another planet out there somewhere, Planet Nine. Not Planet Nine, that's a whole different story. Pla planet Nine out there, which is what causes some of the tilts uh, in the axis of the others. Okay. I'm gonna, this is basically more information along the same line. Now, not only that, out in space, Look out there, and you're going to see things like a horsehead nebula. Why would he create a horsehead nebula out in the middle of space? Again, as much of this is, I think, part of his amusement, or or to make us uh, say, "Huh." Okay. Now these are funny. These are precariously balanced rocks. Precariously balanced rocks. Uh, this one, for example. Here, look at that is the neck there. This one almost looks like Lyle Levitt to me. <laughs> okay? Uh, of course, that's another joke all in and of itself. All right, this one we've got, this looks like uh, something from Popeye the Sailor uh, cartoon, like may, Alice the Goon or whatever it may be. Maybe you remember those. Okay? Precariously valorous rocks. Okay, here, this one. Look at how big this rock is. How small, by comparison to the man here on the side, but it's balanced on this tiny little neck. Okay, this one kind of looks like a prairie dog poking his head up out of the ground, looking around. Can you see it? Okay. Um, these are uh, here. again. Look how big this boulder is, balanced precariously on this cliff, on that tiny little spot there. This one looks like a boomerang. I don't want to step on there. Again, these are just things to make you say, huh. Okay. This one looks like something out of Egypt or uh, Planet of the Apes. I'm not sure which. Okay. 
These are just more precariously balanced rocks. Or how about this one? Is a, an egg a balanced on top of things right here. I want to see this one. And look, this one, huge boulder. Huge boulder on two very spindly legs. Hmm. You wonder, how did that come about? What kind of erosive processes had to occur to create these sorts of things? Hmm. Hi. Um, next one, this one. Uh, or oh, here's something rather interesting. In the Australian outback, you've got nothing but flat plains everywhere. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, is this red sandstone rock, uh, Ayers rock, that appears in nowhere. And more of the rock is down below the ground, like a, in a, a diamond shape there, than there is above the ground. But out of nowhere, you're looking across the plain, and it's blank, flat, barren plains, essentially, and then all of a sudden this rock pops up. Then we also have one, a similar situation in uh, America. Here's what's called Devil's Tower. This is in uh, Wyoming, uh, just to the uh, north of uh, Yellowstone and to the north uh, west of uh, uh, Mount Rushmore, etc., like this. Again, a flat plain, basically. There's some uh, forest and shrubbery uh, along here to the side, and suddenly, whoop, out of nowhere. This big old rock comes up, and it's got a flat mesa across the top of it. Hmm. So you might say, where did that come from? How did that happen? What erosive processes made that? Okay. All right, so uh, this, is a, this one's from Norway. The big old mountain here, and there's a crevice right through the middle, of, and a hole right in the middle of, the, of that crevice. How did you make that? What erosive process is that? This one from Thailand. Not Thailand, that's Trump's place. Um, this is a, a strange sort of mountain rock formation out in the middle of the bay. Hmm. Okay. This one, David, uh, you might uh, have seen this one. Uh, it's just north of... Uh, I-40 going to uh, western into New Mexico, just about north of Tucumcari. Okay, so this one is a camel. You see the camel shape here? It's a Bactrian camel, very much like it. How do you create that? What erosive processes do that? Okay, this one is called the Badlands uh, Guardian. It's in South Dakota. Um, let's see, this would be just um, north uh, west of uh, Mount Rushmore. Uh, it's uh, east of the Devil's Tower we were talking about earlier. Strange thing about this, you can't see it from ground level. It's only visible from the air. But you see the Native American uh, chief here with his head bonnet around. I'm not just projecting this, is there? And it's called the, the uh, Badlands Guardian. This is artistry. How do you create that? Okay, here's another one. I wonder, how do you create that? How'd you do that, Mr. Wizard? Anyone catch that illusion? Anyway, um, so this is a stone arch, as you see here, with a narrow little bridge across the top. This is in off South Sydney, I think, if I remember correctly. Look at that sandstone and uh, the different color striations there. That's amazing how you can get that sort of back. Now, uh, these are what I would call God's artistry. These are actual caves um, in the Mideast, I think, in Jordan, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the, the look at the colors. You see all the colors and the striations and all the different formations that are formed there. And then the light comes in from above to create the artwork. Mm. All right, there's another one. Boulders, spheres. You know how hard it is to make a perfect sphere? Well, look at this. We've got a huge amount of sphere. This is one they put digging out of the ground. This shows you the relative size of some of them. Here's a human, full-grown adult human being 
beside it, and here's a bunch of spheres all together. How do you make spheres? These are botanical oddities now. This one it is a huge, huge flower. It blooms, though, only once in its lifetime. Beautiful thing to look at, but it smells like a rotting corpse. So why do you make something beautiful and then have it smell like a rotting corpse? Again, this is that, that sense of humor. And this one, Venus flytraps. Not enough to get the, light, uh, get the nourishment from the soil and from the sunlight, but no, this one he, it, it is a carnivorous. It eats flies and other bugs as well. Why would you do something like that? These are other kinds of carnivorous plants. These are called pitcher plants. What they do is they, uh, it's a long pitcher-like uh, shape here, a bowl-like shape like this, filled with liquid. The liquid is fragrant. It attracts the insects to it. But once they get close enough to it, then they slip and fall inside and it dissolves. So the pitcher, the pitcher plant eats them effectively. Here's a, few, a couple of more up close. And they can be very beautiful. Look at the, uh, the artistry, the patterning on this one, for example. This one has a lid on it as well. In fact, they both have lids on it. Okay. Well, here's some more animal oddities. Okay. Everyone knows about giraffes, right? They're odd, odd looking critter to begin with, right? Okay. You know that they are like us, they're mammals, and because they're mammals, they have seven vertebrae in the neck. So there are only seven vertebrae in that long neck. It's just they're thicker. These are the sub Saharan uh, cows, effectively, because they're clean animals to eat. They have a cloven hoof, and they obviously chew the cud. So it meets the two criteria for being a clean animal. There's a subspecies of giraffe, this one called a fat giraffe, which is just massive everywhere. I guess God likes the next bone. All right, here's some more. How about the ostrich? Isn't that a weird-looking bird? Okay, pointed beak, like that. Uh, when it runs, it is off the ground about half the time. Its toes, it only has two toes. So it fails to meet the criteria for a clean animal. So don't be misled into eating ostrich meat because an ostrich, is not, yeah, ostrich and its cousin, the emu, are both not clean because they only have two toes. To be a clean animal, you have to have a clean bird. You have to have a pointed beak, which it's got, but it also has to have three toes forward and one toe back. Okay. Well, that's an interesting oddity. Okay. Let's see. Here's a one, the uh, flamingo, the pink. They're not born pink, but they become pink because of things in the environment. Um, and you notice though, the, the flamingo all, always stands on one leg. Anyone know why? If it took up both legs, it'd fall down. Okay, this is a blue snail. It's kind of like some of the creatures I've seen on Star Trek Enterprise, for example. Okay. Uh, here's our old friend, the duck-billed platypus. I think God put this critter together just to perplex the evolutionists, if nothing else. Because it's got, you know, a duck bill, it's got a beaver-like or otter-like claws in front for digging. It's got a, it's a mammal, uh, so it has fur, and it, uh, and it gives milk, but it lays eggs. And the back claw back here, those are venomous like a snake's fang. How do you put all those pieces together? God must have had a sense of humor for that one. Okay, and it may perplex the uh, evolutionists in the process. Here's one. This is called a star-nosed star mole. Look at the nose on this one. The star-shaped sort of thing and claws. Again, five fingers forward. This is, uh, uh, again, oddities that we're showing you. These are sea creatures, uh, the purple octopus and the blue octopus. These suckers <coughs> are, uh, have three brains, and they squirt ink uh, as a defensive mechanism, among other things. Okay. This one is called a cuttlefish, and it is a chameleon of sort. It, it will, it's a mimic. It, will, it can change its coloring 
change its pattern formation and everything of this nature to blend in with whatever his background is. Okay? Now Chuck, this one might appeal to you. This is an angler fish, one who has his own fishing pole that brought along with him. Okay, so these are down in the bottom, in the depths of the ocean, and it has a fishing pole coming out of his head and a bright light on the end of it. And the bright light attracts the little fishy, and once it gets close enough, it just chomps down on it. Okay, now this is a seahorse. And God did a nasty trick on the seahorse. The males have to carry the babies. <laughs> oh, the blobfish. Here. Okay. This one is actually three creatures together. There are three uh, green sponges. You put them together, though, and they make the cookie monster. Okay. This one is a two headed snake, also known as a criminal lawyer. Okay. Uh, this one is Congress. It has two heads. Still can't decide which way to go. This one is Congress gridlock because the heads are on each end. See? God recognizes what we were going to do ahead of time. Okay? Uh, irony. I think that irony is probably God's favorite form of uh, sense of humor. Irony occurs whenever something appears to be true uh, that is not what is occurs when something appears to be true is not what is really true. All right, for example, we have four forms. Verbal, uh, situational, dramatic, and cosmic. Verbal uh, 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 irony is, uh, is something like when the intent of the words differ greatly from what is said, like non-malicious sarcasm. An example, in Amos, Amos 4, 6, uh, God says, I gave you clean, cleanness of teeth. What he doesn't tell you is the reason you have cleanness of teeth is there's a famine going on. So there's no food to get the teeth dirty in the process. Um, how about this one? Situation when circumstances are, uh, uh, are opposite to desired or expected. Uh, o. Henry's Gift of the Magi is a classic illustration of this one. Uh, what we have here is that we had a uh, husband and wife. Husband uh, had a gold pocket watch he was most proud of, and the wife had long, beautiful black hair, and it was unproud. So it came time, in this case it was for a Christmas gift, or what I think it was, but anyway, so they each one went out to buy the other one a gift. The husband sold his pocket watch to buy a comb for his wife's beautiful black hair. The wife cut her hair and sold it in order to get a chain for the husband's pocket watch. <laughs> That's an example of situational uh, um, irony. Okay? Uh, how about dramatic irony? This is when the audience or the reader knows something that the character doesn't. Okay, for example, uh, when Jacob was wrestling with the angel of the Lord, with the pre-incarnate form of Jesus, he did not realize that he had his hands on the God at that time. Cosmic, when the cosmic forces conspire against the ca character. Classic illustration, this one is something called an appointment in Samaria. Um, a man, a merchant, uh, and his friend were uh, in the marketplace, and he looked up and saw death, the angel of death coming toward him. And it scared him so much. And he, he got on his horse and he, and he flew uh, away uh, on his horse as fast as he had headed north towards Samaria. And uh, the, his friend asked Death, why did you scare my friend? And Death said, I wasn't trying to scare him. I was just surprised to see him there since I have an appointment with him today in Samaria. So he flew right into the hand of, to fulfill his fate. And that's one of the things that happens a lot. We have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, let's go to some biblical story. All right. Uh, first one that I find interesting is uh, Abraham and Sarah uh, going to sire Isaac here. And at this time, um, Sarah is 90 years old. Abraham, 99 to 100, depending on which verses that you're reading here. And 
the, the questions arise. I guess there was something akin to a little blue pill back in Abraham's day as well. But uh, first you had the problem of how do you sire a child when you're that old? Okay. There's some mechanics that I won't get into that are a bit difficult for people that age. But uh, Sarah laughed and we went on. And this is, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall call her name Sarah, but she, uh, and I will... And I will bless her and give you a son uh, by her. And I will bless her and she shall be called the mother of the nation. Kings of people shall go from her. And uh, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Continuing here. Uh, and then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, Here in the tent. Um, and he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. Sarah had long passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure with my Lord being old also? That's a reasonable question to ask. It's a humor here that, that God would give a very elderly couple a child and expect them to take care of it. There's humor in both the creating of the child and in the birthing of the child and in the rearing of the child from at that age. Okay, let's see. I'm running short of time. Uh, let's see. And this is the confirmation of it, the actual um, uh, reappearance of God when uh, all of these, by the way, are on the back of the sheet that I gave you so that you can uh, go read about them on your own if you'd like to do so. Okay. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm checking my time here. Okay, Rebecca and Jacob fool Isaac. Or when Isaac gets old, nearly blind, he's going to pass on the blessing to his uh, to uh, his children. His two children are Esau and uh, Jacob, of course. Now, uh, Esau is uh, Isaac's favorite. He's a man's man, you know, rugged, uh, a hairy beast, uh, smells of the plain, etc., like this. So he's Isaac's favorite. On the other hand, uh, uh, Jacob was more Rebecca's favorite. He's a, a a little more delicate, shall we say, than the other. He was uh, hairless and a smooth uh, skin. So what they decided to do is that um, Isaac tells uh, Esau to go fetch him his, his fine venison and bring it uh, bring it back for him to take as a tasty treat, and Rebecca overhears this and tries to fool him by creating a kid, a goat, spiced up and cooked just the way he wants it, and he puts a hairy shirt on to Jacob and uh, uh, makes him smell of the, uh, the wood, and then sends him in to uh, Isaac to fool him. And in effect, what happened is that not only ha does... Uh, Isaac get the Isaac pass on the uh, birthright be, uh, b before, but the blessing as well. So he ends up with both of those. Uh, again, I'm, I'm skipping through some of this rather quickly. Uh, Jacob works to marry uh, uh, Rachel and Leah. Laban is his uh, uncle, and he tries for um, years. He works with them for years and years and years to get the daughter's hand in marriage. He wants, he wants, so, Rachel. Leah's the older and kind of homely, apparently, but he, Laban tricks Jacob and has him to work for uh, years and years, uh, seven years, I think, if I remember correctly, for the, the hand of his daughter's in marriage, and then gives him Leah instead of Rachel. So he ends up having to work another seven years in order to get the wife he wanted in the process. So that, that's got some humor to it. 
as well. Uh, Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Okay. So he, here he is in the, in the um, plains. He rose that night, took his two wives, and two female servants, and 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jacob. He took them, sent them to the brook. And, he le- and when Jacob was left alone, a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now, he didn't know it at the time, but this man that wrestled with him turned out to be the angel of the Lord. This was the pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ. And it's kind of amusing that Jesus would get out and wrestle with the guy on, in the dirt. Kind of reminds me of the story about the, the, the arguing with a politician. It's kind of like wrestling with a pig in the mud. Okay, You both get dirty in the process, but the pig likes it. So, anyway... He says, all right, where am I? Come on. And this is when he gets his name changed. And uh, uh, so the angel of the Lord said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. But, uh, by the way, Jacob means cunning, supplanter, whereas Israel means saint of God. Um, so there's a difference in the name change here, what they mean. Uh, then... Uh, Jacob asked, uh, tell me your name. Say, uh, why is it you ask my name? And he blessed him there and he said, so, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Okay. Then here's another. Jacob is a smart man. Uh, very crafty, very cunning. So what he did here is he, he made a deal with Laban, his uncle, so that he would get all the animals that were speckled or spotted along the way. So what he did is he put stakes, speckles and stuff, stake in the ground whenever they went to, to drink water. And in the process, what happened? Those who saw the speckled uh, stakes and things became speckled themselves. Their, their children, the, 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 the cows became speckled themselves. And Jacob then got all the best uh, of, of the breed. It was selective breeding is what it amounts to being. Mm. Okay, this was the kind of funny. Of course, you all know this story about uh, Jacob the Streaker. Okay, once he was in the house of the uh, Pharaoh and, he, and the wife made advances to him and uh, uh, he wanted, she said, she said, caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. So he was, he don't fail me now. He's running stripped naked through the center of the score rather than, than go in with this woman. Okay. Again. Okay. Instead of doing, going through all of these, let me just point to a few of the as I am running short of time. Um, we've got Jacob blessing Ephraim and Manasseh, and when he does so, the normal procedure is that you would come forward with the blessing, the older toward the right hand and the younger toward the left hand. But what Jacob does in this one is he crosses his hand and places the blessing on the other one. So, not so. Oh, the, uh, the, my my. Funniest, one of the funniest ones in here is the story of Balaam's ass. Can you imagine that you're going along and suddenly your, your donkey stops dead in his tracks, doesn't move. And you try beating him, whipping on him, everything of this nature, and he doesn't move. Turns out there's an angel standing in the pathway there. And so to, uh, God opens the mouth of the, of the donkey and allows the donkey to speak in the process. So, I find that uh, very amusing. Okay, on the back of this one, you have the ten plagues of the, uh, um, against the house of Egypt. And the first one, turning the blood to Nile. Uh, turning the Nile to blood. Second one, the plague of frogs. And the third one was the dust turned into bugs. And that's when they stop. Because the other gods cannot keep up with them from that point. But the 
funny thing about this one is that each time that Moses and, uh, performs one of these miracles here, the one of the plagues and brings it upon him, they, uh, the gods of Egypt say, oh, we can do that. And they just compound the problem by repeating the same plague over again. So you end up with a bunch of frogs everywhere. Uh, you, and uh, this is against Hecate, uh, the goddess of fertility, water of resurrection. So they actually end up crawling into bed with them. I mean, there's mm, all sorts of humorous things. There's pain on that. I'll let you read these stories on your own. I want, do want to get to one, though, that is the uh, on idolatry. Uh, the one at, of Elijah at Mount Carmel is, is funny. Let's just get to the... Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people, I was oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds fair. Uh, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophet of Baal, uh, choose one bull for among yourselves, prepare it first, for you, are, uh, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given to them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal, uh, Baal uh, from morning until evening, to, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they left to about the... Then they leapt about the altar, or dancing and everything, which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he's busy, or he's off on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping, and you must awaken him. You hear what's going on? See the mockery that's going on? So they cried aloud, and they cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out upon them. Okay. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid any attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your, uh, be your name. And then, with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two sailors of seed. And he put the wood in the order and cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt uh, sacrifice and on the wood. And then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, Do it a third time. And they did. And the water ran all, ran all around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel, and that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Okay? Then that, you, you, can you see the... the, the uh, uh, all right. All right. All right um, I've got many, many more things that I could tell you about. There is humor scattered throughout the entire uh, Bible Take advantage of it. And don't be afraid to laugh. There are things in here that are hilarious. Give yourself the freedom to. Uh, we've got a floating axe head. The, the passages on idolatry are crazy. Uh, and even the little one, Jesus' first uh, miracle, turning water into wine, what does he say to his mother? He says, woman, what am I going to do with you? That's got a tone of humor to it. Not, so much, not the angry. Uh, we've got Peter uh, being called, and he, we've got the, he's just been out fishing all night, hasn't caught a thing. Jesus said, 
Throw your nets on the other side, and they bring in a haul that's too big for them to handle. Uh, Peter's walking on water. You can almost count on Peter. Peter brings a lot of humor to this story. Uh, there's a passage where Peter wants a bath. There's not just my feet, but my uh, body also. And, of course, uh, he's whacking off Malchus's ear um, at the end. Uh, Matthew 17, 27, you've got a fish and a coin in the mouth. There's all sorts of humor. Enjoy it. It's there for you. Okay. Uh, uh, that's enough. All right. Uh, let's you go ahead and, uh, with that one. But again, go through all of these stories and many, many, many more if you'd like to as well.